We have now reviewed how an international system of protection for freedom of expression has been established through the United Nations and how equally important steps were undertaken by Europe and Latin America. For this segment, we will focus on how Africa followed suit, adopting its own provision for the protection of freedom of expression and establishing a number of institutions responsible for overseeing state compliance of their commitment. What is the context of the emergence of the African human rights system? It's May 1963. Delegates from 32 African independent countries meet in Addis Abeba, the capital of Ethiopia, and they establish the Organization for African Unity, OAU. In 2002, the OAU was replaced by the African Union. At the time of the OAU birth, the region was in the midst of its fight against colonialism. There were wars uh, against colonialism throughout the region and emerging democracies in a number of countries. The first four decades following the early 1960s independence movement was a period of great instability, faltering democracies, strengthening of one-party systems, and war, such as the Biafra War and famine, resulting in many million dead. The OAU in 1963, though, symbolized the aspiration of a continent for independence, political, economic, cultural, ideological. It also stood, as its name indicates, for unity across the continent, reflecting pan-African ideals and identity. Not surprisingly thus, the OAU insisted primarily on the principle of national sovereignty and self-determination, more than indeed on human rights protection, let alone holding emergent independent governments to account for human rights violation. This lack of attention for human rights was not helped by its international context, that of Cold War, with the notion that human rights were the product of Western imperialism. Still, in Africa, political and intellectual leaders are emerging who are intent on ensuring that the continent does not lag behind anymore, including on human rights protection. And so in 1979, the OAU adopted a resolution calling for the creation of a committee of experts to draft a continent-wide human rights instrument, similar to those that already existed in Europe and the Americas. Two years later, in 1981, the African Charter for Humans and People's Rights was adopted. In 1987, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights was established, responsible for overseeing and interpreting the African Charter. Before turning to an analysis of the protection of freedom of expression, let me highlight a few features of the African Charter. It has been described by some as modest in its objectives and flexible in its means. There is large reliance on so-called clawback provisions. I will go back to it, but basically it's a provision that weakens the protection afforded. This indeed concerns directly the right to freedom of expression. In fact, the African system more than balanced the initial weakness within the text, and that largely thanks to the African Commission. So, on one hand, it has some very weakly drafted provision. On the other hand, the African Charter includes a strong focus and protection on group rights or people's rights and ensuring that these are enforceable. This is a level that you cannot find in Europe or indeed within the inter-American system. That's possibly not surprising given the history of the birth of the OAU and still it is a fundamentally important addition to human rights protection that comes to us via the African system. Yet another aspect of the African human rights system is that it has established a range of mechanisms responsible for enforcement of the Charter, and that individuals and organizations, not just victims, can complain for violation of their human rights. Let's now turn to freedom of expression. Under Article 9, the African Charter guarantees every individual the right 
to receive information and express and disseminate his or her opinion within the law. That's basically, I basically quoted from the article here. Every individual shall have the right to express and disseminate his opinions within the law. So that little uh, segment here, within the law, is said to constitute a clawback clause because if its use of the term law is interpreted to mean any domestic law, regardless of its effect, states, in essence, would be able to negate the right conferred upon individual by the Charter. The limitation set forth by Article 9 of the African Charter is as both imprecise and overbroad and would place unlimited restrictions, basically, on freedom of expression. However, that's where the African Commission comes in and uh, by its ruling, by its advisory opinion, is going to limit the impact of that so-called clawback clause. The African Commission on Human and People's Rights, the African Commission, was established by virtue of Article 30 of the African Charter with a specific mandate to promote human and people's rights and ensure their protection in Africa. It can hear and rule over complaints submitted by individuals, NGOs or state parties to the African Charter. It does not have binding forces over the member state, but its communication has a strong advisory role and influence and indeed are heavily quoted by the various courts established at regional level, sub-regional level, and uh, at all um, national state. In fact, expectation of compliance with the African Commission decisions appear to have emerged. So this is a very important body for the continent. Over the years, in response to complaints, the Commission has developed jurisprudence on human people's rights in general and the right to freedom of expression in particular, including on the issue of its legitimate restrictions. The jurisprudence function of the African Commission is particularly important because until last year the African Court for Human Rights had only issued very few judgments on freedom of expression, but we will return to that. One of the key interpretations by the African Commission, and indeed the first one, has been of the so-called clawback clause, the within the law. Early on, it ruled that this provision constituted a reference to international law, not domestic, meaning that the only restrictions that can be enacted by the relevant national authorities are those which are consistent with state parties' international obligations. Let me quote here from a 1998 communication made with regard to a case brought by an NGO, Media Rights Agenda, against the government of Nigeria, which had proscribed the publication of two magazines and ten newspapers, arguing that it was doing so within the law. What did the African Commission say? I quote, According to Article 9.2 of the Charter, dissemination of opinions may be restricted by law. This does not mean that national law can set aside the right to express and disseminate one's opinion. This would make the protection of the right to express one's opinion ineffective. To allow national laws to have precedent over the international law of the Charter would defeat the purpose of the rights and freedom enshrined in the Charter. International human rights standards must always prevail over contradictory national law. Any limitation on the rights of the Charter must be in conformity with the provision of the Charter. The jurisprudence of the African Commission abounds in examples in which it has stated that limitations are to be in accordance with state parties' obligations under the Charter, meaning with international human rights law. Thus, the Commission was able to neutralize the clawback clause by relying on its duty to interpret the Charter in light of international human rights jurisprudence. Following the 1981 adoption of the African Charter and Article 9 on freedom of expression, 
a second step toward the protection of freedom of expression in Africa took place in 2002. At its 32nd session held in Banjul, the African Commission adopted by resolution the Declaration of Principles on Freedom of Expression in Africa. And you will find that declaration in, in your readings throughout uh, the course. The declaration is a result of the combined effort of many stakeholders working on freedom of expression across the continent, in the first place civil society organizations. It sets out important benchmarks and elaborates on the precise meaning and scope of the guarantees of freedom of expression laid down under Article 9 of the African Charter. For instance, the Declaration on Freedom of Expression states that no one shall be subject to arbitrary interference with his or her freedom of expression. Any restrictions on freedom of expression shall be provided by law, serve a legitimate interest and be necessary in a democratic society. So the, the Declaration on Freedom of Expression elaborate on the uh, Article 9 of the African Charter, which is very brief, and it gives more meaning to, to this article alongside, of course, the jurisprudence and the opinion of the African Commission. A third step for the protection of freedom of expression in Africa occurred in 2004. The African Commission established a special rapporteur on freedom of expression in Africa. Basically, it is an expert, an African expert, who is going to be responsible for overseeing the implementation of Article 9 of the African Charter and, and telling states, monitoring states' implementation and telling them when and where they are not doing what they should do. A few years later, the mandate of the Special Rapporteur was extended to include specifically access to information held by public authorities. So what we have in Africa at the text level is uh, a fairly extensive system of protection for freedom of exp uh, expression. The system of enforcement is also fairly extensive. Uh, they are still in their infancy stage because uh, they came about uh, you know, over the last decade or possibly two decades, but have so far demonstrated, in my view, a willingness to deliver important rulings protecting freedom of expression and human rights in general. I've already mentioned the Commission. In addition to the Commission, there is also the African Court for Human Rights and there are sub-regional instruments such as the Court of Justice for the East African Community or the West Africa Economic Community, or ECOWAS. The African Court delivered its first judgment in 2009, and as of today has ruled over 25 cases. This includes a 2014 case on freedom of expression. The court ruled against Burkina Faso in a case brought by the family of a newspaper editor who was murdered in 1998. The court found that Burkina Faso had failed to properly investigate the murder and had failed in its obligation to protect journalists. The African Court judgment provided an authoritative interpretation of the African Charter and it is having a large impact on the right to freedom of expression and in particular on the fight against impunity for crimes committed against journalists. The East African Community is an intergovernmental organization composed of six countries in the African Great Lake region of Eastern Africa. It is supported by an East African Court of Justice, which has jurisdiction over the interpretation and application of the East African Treaty of 1999, and it has already delivered very progressive ruling on the protection of human rights, including on the protection of freedom of expression earlier this year, 2016. West Africa also has its own sub-regional institution called the Economic Community of West Africa, or ECOWAS. ECOWAS has established a court which has competence to rule on human rights violations through an individual complaint procedures since 2005, 
particularly noteworthy is the fact that local remedies do not need to have been exhausted because cases are brought to the ECOWAS Court of Justice. It means that an individual who has a complaint or whose rights has been violated but who cannot find justice in his or her country and who think that in any case justice cannot be delivered can go directly to ECOWAS to seek um, remedies and, and redress. The jurisprudence as of now is not as extensive as that of the European system or the inter-American system. So comparative analysis is premature. However, as I will show in a supplementary video, in Africa, those bodies at the African level or at sub-African level have already delivered very important ruling on freedom of expression for the protection of freedom of expression on the African continent. To wrap up, we have reviewed in this segment a third system of protection for freedom of expression, that of Africa. The standard protecting freedom of expression in Africa present many similarities with those in Europe and Latin America and indeed with the international system. Africa has also established an extensive system of enforcement for the protection of freedom of expression, including special court, including a special rapporteur, including the African Commission, some of which are binding on member states. Next, and in conclusion, we will review the baby steps taken by the rest of the world, Asia and the Middle East in particular, to establish regional systems of accountability for the protection of freedom of expression.